armchair history course. And I just, I love this graphic. I'm so happy about it. This uh, was developed by the Friends of the Library. And in particular, it was developed by Dave Conrad. I didn't see, he, he's enrolled in the class. I don't know if he's here, but if you are, Dave, um, thank you very much. I really love this. I love the blue chair, so I'm excited. That's our, our graphic for the class. So we're going to be doing uh, five classes in this series, um, and it's presented as a collaboration between us and Harper Library. And the first one this week is Southport and the War to End All Wars. Now, I chose that name carefully. I could have called it so Southport and World War I, but when you're looking at history, it's always best to try to get into the mindset of the people that you're trying to, to study. And they obviously didn't call it World War I because they didn't know there was going to be a World War II. They thought of it as a, a unique war, a catastrophic war, um, with so many new kinds of weaponry, so many countries involved, so many lives lost, that they, they felt it had to be the final war. Um, and I, I really want to underscore the, the optimism, maybe the naivete of, of people at that time. It was during a period of time called the Progressive Era, in, in which a great many people thought that they could solve the the vices and the ills of the day, such as um, drinking and domestic violence and, and bad labor conditions. And so I think it's consistent that they would think they could fight one huge war and then be done with war for all time. So, so that's kind of my, my thinking behind that. Um, this is the timeline. This I sent to you guys um, in case you wanted you know, to refer to it during the class. Um, and it just shows the top is the timeline by year, and then I broke down the 19-month the period of the, of the war itself and some of the events that happened in Southport in particular, so you could keep it straight. Um, okay. Could, are you, I'm going to... I'm gonna mute everybody. There we go. Okay, that's better. If you have a question, take your mic off mute, but otherwise um, leave it on, okay? All right, um, so World War I started in Europe in 1914, but the US didn't become involved until three years later in 1917. So from our perspective, more than 100 years later, it's, it's easy to forget how controversial the US involvement in that war was. It was the first, war that we were involved in where we defended uh, foreign soil. Um, our country was really, and that was very controversial, uh, whether we should get involved or not. Our country was at a distance from the war and there was a strong contingency that wanted us to isolate ourselves. And in fact, Woodrow Wilson ran his reelection campaign in 1916 on the slogan, he kept us out of the war. But very quickly after his second term started, some things changed and he decided we should get involved in the war. And once he changed his mind, his commitment, to, he committed as wholeheartedly to involving us in the war as he had once committed to keeping us out of it. So not only was our country isolated from Europe, Southport was isolated from much of Brunswick County. So as you, as you probably know, Brunswick County is about the size of Rhode Island. And at that time, there were only 15,000 people living in the entire county. That's about a tenth as how many live, there, live here now. Um, and there were only about 1,500 living in Southport. One of the reasons that Southport was isolated was that it was not that easy to get to from most of the county. There were not very many roads, and the ones that there were there were just not very well maintained. They were mostly dirt roads, uh, although some of the ones nearer to Southport were covered with shells. This picture here of this road is Southport Supply Road, 211. Cars were a novelty in Southport, although they had started to appear. The very first car had arrived in Southport in 1910 when a man from South Carolina drove up to visit some acquaintances in Southport. Now, how do I know that? Because it was such a significant event that it was written up in the newspaper. And that can seem kind of quaint to us now, but just think what a marvel that would have been to see your very first car. 
So by the time the war started, cars were a bit more common and there was even a gas station in town. Another means of travel to Southport was the passenger train. After absolutely decades of effort by the town leaders, the railroad had finally come to town. This picture is from the grand opening of the railroad in 1911. This particular line uh, was known as the W, B, and S, which stood, officially stood for Wilmington, Brunswick, and Southern. However, the locals all said it stood for willing but slow. In terms of speed, it could never compete with a steamship, even when the steamship was heading upriver. So despite advances in transportation, the main method of transportation to Southport remained the way it had always been, via the river. Steamships could travel between Southport and Wilmington in three hours. And that was the way the majority of people, goods, and mail traveled. In this picture, you see passengers waiting along the pier for the arrival of the steamship from Wilmington. Don't they look nice? So even though Southport was not easy to get to from the rest of the, rest of the county, rest of Brunswick County, it, it was easy to get to from Wilmington. Up by up and down the river. And so for a long time, Southport had been the county seat. By the early part of the 20th century and the time that uh, World War I started, um, other towns in the county had started to grow. Uh, and as we saw, Southport only had 10% of the population. So it was hard for people from those other inland towns to travel over land to Southport. And there was a strong push to move the county seat inland. However, Southport was able to delay that move until the 1970s when it was finally relocated to Bolivia. But at the time of World War I, the county jail and the county courthouse were both in Southport. And whenever court was in session, the attorneys and judges uh, that needed to travel to the county seat would travel to Southport by steamboat. They all liked to stay at the Stewart House. And that's the building that you see on the right it was located on the east end of Bay Street along the waterfront. Now the Stewart House had been a landmark in Southport since before the Civil War, and it was run by a woman named Miss Kate Stewart. So the judges and lawyers loved to stay at the Stewart House because of its location and its view. Here you can see the view to the, on the river from, from the house. But even more they liked to stay there because of the fine food and the conversation provided by Kate Stewart. She was known as one of the most educated and accomplished women in Southport. She was really a fascinating woman and we're going to be discussing her more in some upcoming classes on the women in Southport and I can tell you about those later. So in addition to being a businesswoman, a landowner, and the only woman in Southport that was on the Chamber of Commerce, Kate was the inaugural president of the Civic Club. And that organization did much to improve the living conditions in Southport. So even though women didn't yet have the right to vote, they were bringing their influence to the town. In 1909, they started the Civic Club that, that Kate was president of. And one of the first things they did was to get the local businesses to stop throwing their trash in the streets. Instead, they put barrels out front for trash. And then eventually, they managed to get them to move the barrels into the back behind the businesses because that's where they burned their trash as well and they wanted them to do it off of the streets. They also encouraged the planting of gardens, they got citizens to clean up the burial ground, and they even started the town's first library in the garrison. Now if you look closely uh, in this picture, on the bottom part you'll see a lamp, a street light. That was the town's first street light and it was paid for by the Civic, Civic Club. It was at the corner of Nash and Dry Street. Uh, the Civic Club was also very interested in promoting the health of children in the town and they started an annual baby parade. So the women, you can see that they're all dressed up and then they dressed up their kids and they would walk them around and show off their babies. So one of the other projects for the Civic Club was helping the local school by sewing curtains for the windows and other improvement projects. This picture is of the graded school for the white children in town. 
Now, it was called the graded school uh, to distinguish it from being a one-room schoolhouse. It had actual grades. So that civic club that Kate Stewart was the first president of still exists today in Southport, but is known as the Southport Women's Club. And they continue to do a great deal to improve the community of Southport. So now that you have an idea of just how rural and isolated Southport was, I want to mention one other anecdote. So one day, right around the, uh, World War I, less than a decade after the first car had driven into town, hundreds of spectators gathered on the garrison grounds to watch the performance of a single hydroplane. It was Southport's first sight of an airship on its shores, and it was a very big event locally. So this picture is not actually from Southport, uh, but it is the type of plane that visited. It was a Curtis Flyer, and the pilots would take their airship between 300 to 4,400 feet into the air. And they offered, the pilots offered flights to spectators for $15 each, which would be about $260 in today's currency. So two men took a chance and they, they took a 10 mile trip in the airplane and they declared it was well worth the, the money. So even though that last picture was not actually of Southport, this picture is, this was a uh, main business area in Southport. And I really like it because it shows that still the main transportation was horse and buggy or walking. And so when I look at this picture and I see these two little boys in the right hand corner, I just picture how amazed they must have been to see this airplane suddenly appear in front of the garrison lawn, taking off and, and, and landing in the water. So at that time, there was no civilian hospital anywhere in Brunswick County. There was a, a rather crude government facility at the Quarantine Station, but that was meant mostly for housing sailors who had infectious diseases like yellow fever or the measles. Um, largely because of the Quarantine Station, though, Southport was fortunate en enough to have a few doctors in town. And Dr. Dosher was a well-respected local man. He had uh, gone away to college in Maryland and returned home after he became a doctor. He was known to be a highly skilled surgeon who was not above performing surgeries right on his own kitchen table, which probably did not thrill Mrs. Dozier overly much. So most people at the time earned their living on the water, and this is the waterfront uh, for Southport along where the park is now. So you can see it looked very different back then when it was a commercial active working waterfront rather than a park-like setting. Menhaden or pogey fishing was big business. Now Menhaden fish were no good for eating. They were um, awful stinky bony fish, but they made excellent fertilizer. And there were several fisheries were established in Southport and Oak Island, and there the fish were, were ground up and packaged. Um, but this, the fish had a very foul smell, and so uh, when the wind was right, that smell would permeate the towns from the fish factories, and especially when, when the wind was blowing inland, and some people would complain about the smell. But other people would point out to them that they should not mind that odor at all because that was the smell of money. Liz? Yes. I have uh, one question. Could you possibly go back to the slide before this one? Sure. I just have a question. Mm -hmm. is, is that tower in the background, is that the tower that came down in the storm a month ago? or Do you know? Well, is that the same tower? Um, Bob Surge or Pat Kirkman, do you know? It doesn't look, the position doesn't look right to me, but maybe I'm confused on, uh, on where this picture was taken from. I, it look like I think very much it could be, Liz, because yeah. with the location of the pavilion that you see on the wall. Okay. The, the last building is what they called the pavilion. Yeah. That's, it was roughly where the, the, the city dock is today. Okay, great. So, so this is further west than I had realized, does, so, okay. Does that have a, does that photo have a, a date on it? It's it, not really 
legible, but I, I think I think that would make sense because what else other tower would it be? And that is the pavilion. So uh, yes, the, say, uh, yes, I I do. Th it's Pat. I think that uh, it is the uh, the weather tower. Uh, but the house uh, that we see there on the left um, is I'm pretty sure that that's um, the Gore House uh, on the corner maybe or wh whatever but yes the pavilion was right in front of basically where the pier is now so that tower would be in line with right with that, that. yeah, yeah. Okay. and and um the the weather tower had been up there over a hundred years when it fell down last month or whatever right. yeah it so, did yeah mm -hmm. now, now the pavilion is the building with like that widow's walk on the on the roof or yeah with the little pagoda watch. on top yes. the little, yeah, yeah the little cupola the pavilion is no, is no longer there, but yes, right. that, um, right. yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for that. That Appreciate was a, a good question. Okay, that worked well. So if anybody has a question, just chime in because that worked really well. Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay, so we were talking about the uh, the Menhaden fishing. I think I told you everything I wanted to tell you about that particular slide. Then the next one is a picture of actual Menhaden fishermen. Um, and this picture, what they're doing is something called hardening the catch. So in the center there, that is full of fish and water. Uh, and that's a, those are the nets. And so they've, they've surrounded the fish with these nets and they're pulling on the nets, trying to get the water out and the fish to remain. So as you can imagine, this was extremely difficult work, very backbreaking, challenging work, and it also had to be done in coordination. All the men needed to work together. So to alleviate some of the work and also to coordinate their efforts, they would sing sea shanties. And when the wind was right, you could hear the, the singing from the shores of Southport. You could hear the men out there singing as they worked. So you will notice that all of these men are African-American. Um, and it would be several decades from that time before uh, black men broke the color barrier and became fishing boat captains. But uh, they were more than welcome to work the boats and, and do that heavy lifting. So shrimp houses lined the docks along the waterfront, um, which also provided another source of employment in Southport. This time it was largely uh, African-American women who worked in the shrimp houses, heading shrimp so they could be sent up north to New York City's uh, Fulton Fish Market. Sometimes youngsters would also uh, work there and uh, to make extra money. The pay was the same for both, a nickel a bucket. And there were other fish factories in Southport for oysters and mussels and fresh fish. So uh, Southport's uh, living really did center around uh, the river and uh, fishing. And then this is the river, uh, the pilot tower. And as they had for decades, uh, river pilots watched for large ships coming in from overseas. When they spotted one, they would head out in small boats and the pilot uh, to meet the large ship and the pilot would climb aboard. The ship's captain would then uh, turn the helm over to the pilot who would navigate through the shallow and shifting waters of uh, the river with the shifting sandbars underneath. But it was not all work and no play. This, uh, as, this is the close-up of the building we were just talking about, the pavilion, uh, you can see with the little cupola on top. And that was used for uh, parties and dances and theatrical productions. So uh, people did, did do more than work. They knew how to have a good time. So I wanted to kind of set the stage and let you see uh, what Southport was like during that time so you could could kind of imagine you know how, how isolated and rural it was so you could imagine the the shock that the changes uh, from World War One brought and those simple peaceful times were about to change for Southport far off in Europe a war was raging and on April 2nd 1917 President Wilson asked Congress to declare war on Germany to make the world safe for democracy and to fight a war to end all wars. So Southport, lock up your daughters because the army is coming to town. 
So in today's world, we get so accustomed to troops being sent off to one altercation or another that we forget that there was a time when the United States did not keep a standing army. In fact, keeping a standing army was a pretty controversial thing. So this slide shows the size of the armies of the various countries at the start of World War I. So does anybody want to hazard a guess how many uh, troops the U.S. had at that time? No guesses? Okay, we would have been between Belgium and Montenegro over there on the right. We had somewhere around 200,000 troops, maybe a little less. Most of those were the National Guard. So, if you think about it, building up an army quickly is a huge logistical challenge. First, they had to register all the men. Then they had to conduct a draft. Then they had to transport them, they had to house them, they had to feed them, they had to provide uniforms and medical care, they had to make the uniforms, they had to train them, they, then they had to transport them overseas. But amazingly, in a little over a year's time, we went from having 200,000 troops to 4 million, 2 million of which were sent overseas to fight in Europe. So one of the places that they housed and trained the troops was Fort Caswell on the eastern tip of Oak Island. So since the end of the Spanish-American War in 1898, so it had been about almost 20 years, uh, Fort Caswell had only had a small skeleton crew, but that was about to change very rapidly. In fact, at the start of World War I, there were only two training camps in North Carolina. There was Camp Green near Charlotte, and then there was Fort Caswell. So the first men to be sent to Fort Caswell were from the National Guard because that's the troops that we had. But then they were followed very quickly by new recruits. These are barracks for the enlisted men, and they look pretty good. But unfortunately, the fort was built to accommodate about 450 men, and the average amount stationed at the camp during World War I was 1,500. So the overflow were put into tents until more barracks could be built. And as you can imagine, that was not very satisfactory. Uh, in the summer, they dealt with uh, excessive heat, snakes, mosquitoes, and sand spurs, lots of sand spurs. The winter wasn't any better. Uh, the winter of 1918 was one of the coldest uh, that were then on record in North Carolina. So the tents were very cold and they were heated with these uh, stoves that you see there on the right called Sibley stoves. And those were in, uh, invented in, during the Civil War. And I don't think they worked very well then and they certainly didn't work very well all those years later. This is the headquarters on the left, that building. And then in the background is the hospital. And these are some of the newly formed troops who, until recently, had just been regular working Joes. Um, now, these particular troops look pretty fortunate to me because they have uniforms. The first troops to come through when they first started drafting them um, were asked to bring along some tan pants and some boots, if possible. And if they couldn't afford those, they were asked to at least bring a change of pants and some underwear and socks because it would be at least two weeks before their uniforms got there. And here they are on the parade ground and obviously by this time uh, these troops had managed to get some pretty spiffy uniforms. So because the U.S. had committed to build up its troop presence so quickly, there was a real urgency about the soldiers' stay at Fort Caswell in those years. They were desperately needed on the battlefields of Europe, and therefore the training had to be hurried and intense. And because of the rushed experience, the men were often poorly prepared for what lay ahead. They just came in and they kept turning over and over. But of course the government was continually doing whatever it could to improve the training of the troops. And in January of 1918, the United States War Department proposed the construction of a rifle range adjacent to Fort Caswell, North Carolina and that was to be used for small arms training of soldiers destined for overseas duty. 
So this picture is not a picture from Fort Caswell's rifle range, but it's from one that was very similar. And the targets you see in the background are operated on a mechanism that's being operated by a soldier who is off to the side in a, in a pit that's kind of protecting him from the fire. And he would cause the, by turning, managing this mechanism, he would get the, the targets to go up and down to make them harder to hit. And then as you can see, the men in the foreground uh, are armed soldiers who are getting ready to shoot at those targets. So the Fort uh, Caswell rifle range uh, after World War I was declared surpa surplus uh, and fell into disrepair. There's an organization called the Friends of Fort Caswell Rifle Range that was founded to stabilize and preserve the Fort, the Fort Caswell Rifle Range. And for the past several years, they've been working to also to research, publicize, and preserve the legacies of the men and women of Brunswick County who served in the World War. So if you go to their website, and I will include their website in the additional resources that I send you, you can read stories of the men and women who served during uh, World War I from Brunswick County. And these stories are really well written and well researched, and they're very interesting. So I'll have a link for you uh, that you can follow. So here's a shot of the overall Fort uh, Caswell compound that shows it was practically a little city unto itself. There was the, was the hospital, there was a commissary, a, a bakery, a mess, a mess hall, a YMCA, a barber shop, a laundry, a brig, basically everything that they needed to sustain the men, except of course, entertainment and women. And that leads us to the impact on Southport. So you may be wondering if Fort Caswell is over on Oak Island and Southport is on the mainland and there's no road, there's no bridge, how does that even affect Southport? Well, there was a government steamer named the Getty, which ran frequently to bring the troops to Southport whenever they were off duty. So again, imagine this small fishing village becoming a military town overnight. There were as many troops as there were men, women, and children in Southport. They were young, they were away from home for the first time, and they were preparing to go overseas to fight a foreign war, and many of them would not come home. When they had liberty, they wanted ways to amuse, distract, and comfort themselves. Now here was Southport, it was a dry town in a dry county, although there were some pockets of moon shining, which we'll talk about in a few weeks. But imagine how worried the leaders of the town and the mothers of the town must have been about what kind of element this was going to attract. Gambling, alcohol, loose women. And it wasn't just the mothers in Southport who were concerned, it was the mothers of the boys that were being sent off to war who were also concerned, not just about their physical safety, but about their moral and spiritual safety as well. So Southport did an excellent job of managing their overnight change to a military town, but they also had support from an organization called the War Camp Community Service. This organization was part of the Playground Association of America. And they didn't really provide funds uh, to Southport, but they did provide advice and ideas and some leadership. And one of their ideas was to find positive, wholesome activities to entertain the troops before the troops found ways to entertain themselves. So Southport set about creating a place for the men to congregate where they could enjoy some wholesome pleasures and not get into trouble. They set up an Army-Navy club, which was pretty innovative. We think of USOs uh, around the war, but those were really uh, for World War II. This was in World War I, and so this was kind of an innovative idea. And uh, Southport got it set up by August, which was pretty quick. It operated on the whole first floor of the building. So does anybody recognize what building this was? Any ideas? Not the Mason? Yes, is the Masonic Temple, very good, Masonic Lodge. And so here's the picture of what it looks like today. It looks a little bit different. It's over on Nash Street next to Trinity Church. So this is what it looked like on the inside. The Red Cross collected and donated furniture, decorations, games, uh, a Victrola and records. There's a piano you can see in the corner. And there was also plenty of stationery for riding the folks back home. 
And there was a canteen that was run by the Red Cross that sold sandwiches and cakes at low prices. And local women and their daughters, young ladies, signed up to volunteer as hostesses to, um, you know, hang out with the troops. There was also a stage for presentations and performances. And the town built a bowling alley and a gym in the back. And they built a bandstand next door for musical entertainment. In the few months that the boys spent at Fort Caswell, the people of Southport did all that they could to make them feel welcome and appreciated, including inviting them into their homes for home cooked meals and providing support and advice and kind of acting as stand in parents. Because remember, these were really young guys for the most part. And before they shipped out, they made it a point to get their pictures taken on the steps of the Army Navy Club. It had become a tradition and there was a thought to bring them good luck. So I was curious about what the boys were writing in all those letters to the home that they wrote. So I found some letters written by a young man stationed at Fort Caswell. Now he actually was stationed there longer than most of the troops. His superior officer wanted to keep him around uh, because he was a good photographer. And so his job was to photograph all the men as they came through uh, Fort Caswell. And he was clever enough to figure out a side job. He would take pictures of the, the troops for personal for their personal use so they could send them back home to their moms and their sweethearts. So he wrote uh, letters to his sweetheart uh, and he also wrote to his brother who was also in the military stationed elsewhere. But the letters I liked most were the ones he wrote to his mother. She was obviously very worried about him and he did his best to reassure her. He told her that the only alcoholic beverage available to drink was lemon extract, which apparently some of the men did. But he had tried it once found it just as awful as it sounds, and he told her he would not be trying it again. His mother was also worried about submarines, but he assured her that they had big guns and landmines and no submarine was gonna do him any harm. And he also enjoyed telling her about the movies he saw. Movies were a new invention, relatively new, and he was a big fan. And the Southport Theater got new movies every couple of days, and it seems like he saw them all. Uh, he, and he would write his mother and tell her the intricate plots of the movies. Um, the movies cost five cents or ten cents, depending on when you saw them, and you could also purchase parched peanuts for a snack. So here is the theater, the way it looked back then. Um, it's the Museum Theater. Some of you may have seen it. The, this is actually the second building. It was built in 1918. The other one was built in 1912, and I believe Somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the original one is the building right now it says on this picture that says pool room. I think that's where the theater was and then they built the museum right next door. Um, and, it, and it was a big success. That's why they, they did the, um, the bigger one. Um, the theater had uh, benches for seats, the new theater the one that exists today, and it could hold 300 people. There was room for 250 on the first floor where the white people sat, and then there was a gallery for African Americans upstairs that uh, held another 50. One of the first showings at the new theater was a benefit for war sufferers in Europe, and according to the papers, a tidy sum was raised for the cause. Now, in those days, the movies were all silent movies because talkies didn't start until the 20s. But there was a man named Ron Hood, a local man, and he played the piano during the show, setting the mood for the scenes. And the piano players had a great deal of influence to how, as to how the people enjoyed the movies by how they were able to, um, to play either very happy songs or sad songs or dramatic songs. So here's the Amuse You today. I'm sure you've all seen it. It's uh, next to Port City, Java. And if not, when we're allowed to walk around again, you can walk down there and take a look at it. It's been in the same family for over 100 years, the Furplus family. And occasionally it still opens up, not for movies, but for special events and live shows. So now I wanna talk about the Four Minute Men. Has anybody heard about the Four Minute Men or any ideas on how they got their name? Okay, well, the Four Minute Men were men who were good at public speaking, and they were tasked by the federal government to give quick speeches to various groups 
to convince them to buy Liberty Bonds to help support the war. And they would do these speeches, they would rehearse them and rehearse them and get them down just right, and they would do them in four minutes or less. And often they would give those speeches at movie theaters. And so there's reason for that. If you remember the way movies used to be, and there was a projector up behind in the, the booth up a high, and there was an actual projector, and the movies were on these big circular uh, reels of film. And so one reel, reel would play, and then it would get to a point, and it would run out, and it would start making that tip, 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 tip sound. And they would, the projectionist would take that off, and then he would get out the, new, the next reel, and he would load it on, and he would take the film, and he would um, thread it through the projector. And doing all that took an average of about four minutes. And so these men would take advantage of that time, jump up on the stage, give their spiel about buy war bonds, save save your country, do your, your uh, patriotic best, and then the movie would be set to go again and they would jump off. All right, now I have a really important question for you. Does anybody remember Randolph Scott? If you grew up on Saturday morning westerns like I did, he might be a familiar face. And the reason I ask that is because for about a year, he was stationed at Fort Caswell. He was in the Coast Artillery Corps of the National Guard, so he didn't go overseas right away. He, he stayed there. Um, but after about a year, he did transfer to the field artillery of the U.S. Army, and he served overseas. He went to France. So he was 19 when he was uh, there, and uh, I couldn't find a picture of him when he was 19 years old. That top picture, that group picture, is the National Guard, but I don't know which one is Randolph Scott or if he's in the picture. So I don't know exactly what he looked like when he was 19, but this was the youngest picture I could find of him. And I put it up there because I just, that is some serious eye candy to be walking around Southport. Um, and Randolph Scott appeared in more than 100 films during the course of his acting career. He was awarded a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame in 1960. And in 1997, he was posthumously honored with a Golden Boot Award, which is an award given in recognition of significant contributions to the genre of Westerns. So that leads me to a question, because I was thinking about this and I realized he was only 19 years old when he was here, it was a very impressionable age. He spent a year living in Southport, Oak Island. He was riding horses. He was attending movies. And then we get, when he got out of the army, he became a Western movie star. So that makes me wonder, did it all start at the Amusium? So Southport did more than just help the soldiers at Fort Caswell. They also helped the war effort more directly. The National War Garden Commission encouraged Americans to contribute to the war effort by planting, fertilizing, harvesting, and storing their own fruits and vegetables so that more food could be exported to the Allies. Citizens were urged to utilize all vacant land, all idle land that was not already engaged in agricultural production. And that included things like the school grounds, company grounds, parks, backyards, any place that was vacant, it should have vegetables growing in it. So in April of 1917, uh, in the paper it said, never in the history of Southport have there been more and better gardens than this year. The family that does not have a garden is an exception, and nearly all the swamp gardens are in cultivation this year. So swamp gardens were a thing in Southport. There was an area of swamp where people would um, plant gardens. It was out uh, by Taylor Field beyond the, the um, cemetery and so people had gardens in their own yard and then also in the swamps um, and then in may of 1917 there was a large meeting that was held by men of both races in southport for the purpose of encouraging the growing of gardens and also field food crops more than 100 per when they asked uh, who was growing food gardens more than 100 people stood up and and said that they were uh, senator Cranmer, who was the senator then, said that there was still 12 acres that within city limits that were unplanted and that the owners of those lands should either cultivate that vacant land or they should turn it over to someone who would cultivate it and aid in the war effort. So it was decided in the meeting that every vacant lot in the city would be placed under cultivation. And Mr. Berg, who was a native of Denmark, but a loyal American citizen, suggested that, uh, that everyone cooperate in raising pigs. 
And so it was suggested that farmers raise peanuts, potatoes, beans, and et cetera, for the hogs to live on. Okay. And then in April of 1917, uh, Southport chapter of the Red Cross was formed. Uh, Dr. Dosher's wife was one of the founding members and she was elected the financial secretary. Now the Red Cross was very strong in World War I. In fact, there were more uh, Red Cross members in World War I than in World War II, even though the population had grown during the, the time being. So I'm sure a lot of that had to do with the political feelings and a, and a desire to help. But as you can see, there was also a lot of pressure to join and do your part with these posters. You know, what are you doing to help? If you fail, he dies. Uh, it's, the Red Cross is answer, America's answer to humanity, to humanity's challenge. So with this kind of pressure, it would be very hard not to participate. And uh, two weeks after the first Red Cross formed, the, uh, the black residents organized their own chapter of the Red Cross. And both groups began making bandages and knitting socks and doing whatever they could to help the troops overseas. And by June, um, the Red Cross was making arrangements for beds and bandages in case there would be a naval bombardment of Fort Caswell because nobody knew what was going to happen. So on June 5th, across the whole country, there was a military registration day because remember we said to build up the military, the first thing you do is have to have everybody register. So uh, that was nationwide. And so in Southport, it was held uh, at the courthouse here. And the courthouse was decorated with flags and bunting and Red Cross em emblems. And the, the Civic Club, the White Civic Club run by Kate Stewart, they helped register the white men. And then the Black Red Cross um, assisted in, in registering the black men. And the total number registered at Southport uh, on the very first day was 84 white men and 100 black. And then in the afternoon, there was a patriotic parade and it passed along the prominent streets in town. And there were some men who went ahead and volunteered for service with the Coast Guard who um, were then exempt from registration. So I would be remiss if I didn't take a moment to mention that there is an organization right now that is trying to save the historic, this historic building. They want to turn it into an art center and a community gathering space. And when you realize that this building served as our courthouse and city hall, it was the site of the World War I registration, it was the site of the presentation of the flag to the Brunswick County troops during the Civil War, you understand that a lot of history took place here. So the organization that's trying to um, save, the, save this building is called Up Your Arts, and their initiative is called Save the Hall, y'all. So I'll include some information about them uh, in the uh, additional information that I send you, but if you see something around town about Save the Hall, y'all, or Up Your Arts, um, that's what they're doing. Okay, so during World War I, the military was also in need of good doctors and nurses, as you can imagine. And so they did sort of a clandestine evaluation of various doctors in the country, and they knew which ones they wanted. And one of the ones they wanted was Dr. Dosher. So at the time, Dr. Dosher was 40 years old. He was married. He was a father. But despite all of that, he felt it was his duty to go and help the troops overseas. And so he even wanted to serve. Um, so Captain Dosher served as a military physician in France for over a year before coming back to Southport and resuming his practice here. So I've shown you a lot of war posters today and, you know, I get a kick out of them. I enjoy them because they're fun, they're colorful, they're dramatic, and they're entertaining. But again, going back to the mindsets of the people at the time and considering how sheltered and naive the, the populace was to advertisement. Remember, they weren't inundated with television commercials and magazine ads and internet memes and all those things that we see. So these posters were pretty novel and they were very influential. And they were developed out of a branch of the government called the Committee on Public Information. And that was established by President Wilson. And the committee started as a way to promote Ways, uh oh, I'm sorry, my battery's running out. Hold on, I don't know why. Sorry.
Okay, hopefully that fixed it. It was pulled out from the wall a little bit. Okay, so these started as a way to try to get people to um, feel good about the war, to justify the war. It started as a way to help people understand ways that they could help with the war effort, like planting gardens and enlisting and buying liberty bonds. But it just kept growing and growing. And um, after a while, it, it got a bit extreme. So as you can see this um, poster on the right with the, the gorilla with the Hun helmet, that's a, a German kind of helmet, that's representing German people. So it, they made them appear as demons and, and less than human. So it became very dangerous, not just for Germans in Germany, but then German Americans, and then eventually for all Americans. So in May of 1918, so just about a year after we declared war, there was a, a law passed called the Sedition Act of 1918. And this law forbade the use of disloyal, profane, scurrilous, or abusive language about the United States, its government, its flag, its armed forces, or any, anything that caused someone else to view those, those institutions with contempt. It covered um, speech, um, expression of opinions, anything that cast the government or, or the war effort in a negative light or that interfered with the sale of government bonds. So if you said anything that could be construed that you didn't think that the war was necessarily a good idea or that uh, buying all these war bonds and spending all this money was a good idea, these were all things that were punishable. And people that were convicted under this act, and there were people convicted under this act, um, received sentences of imprisonment from, from five to 20 years. They went to prison. Uh, it also allowed the postmaster general, general to refuse to deliver any mail, like magazines and things, uh, that also was seen as subversive. So it was um, a great deal of, of censorship. And I'm sure that there was a lot of sincere patriotism and support of the war by a lot of people. But there was also people who uh, expressed their doubts about the war. And some of them did it publicly, and they went to prison, or even worse. And others were worried about the consequences, but they kept it to themselves because they were afraid of what would happen. So I bring up the, that, the Sedition Act because it was, it was a complete violation of the First Amendment to the Constitution. And the thing was, it was appealed and it went to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court upheld it as constitutional. So people were actually jailed in this country for voicing their opinions. And that's something I associate with like the former Soviet Union. I don't associate it with the United States. And I, I bring it up because most people don't remember that it happened and they don't realize how fragile our free speech is, especially in times of crisis. So after 19 months, basically a year and a half, the war was over. And we started to assess what price we had paid. So we've already talked, we, we, we paid with the loss of our constitutional rights, with a loss of some of our innocence. And in terms of money, uh, the US spent $27 billion in 1918 dollars. But of course, the most important cost was in the number of lives lost. Um, 53,000 men were killed in action. Liz, we can't hear you. Deaths, mostly due to the flu pandemic of 1918, which we're gonna be talking about next year, next week. So as you can see, more died actually from the flu than, um, than died in combat. We lost you there for a few seconds. Can you go back a couple of sentences? Sure. What were you saying? So what we, is it? We lost you. So we saw this band, we saw this, and then you went, your mic was off or something for a little bit. Okay, so where did you, where did you lose me? I'm sorry. After this came up. After the, you showed the um, headline news here. The headline news, you want me to talk about that again? You stop, we lost you when you said 53,000 deaths, combat deaths. Uh, okay. Um, all right, so there are 53,000 men were killed in action, in, in, in battles, right? So that's nearly as many as were killed in the entire Vietnam War. 
Um, so, and then there were another 63,000 killed in non-combat related deaths. And most of those who died were killed, uh, died from the flu pandemic of 1918, which we're gonna talk about next year. So more people died from the flu than from fighting. And, and actually that's, most of the, most of, more people died from illness. And actually that was, that's been true of every single war that the United States has ever fought. And we'll talk about that next week too. More people die from illness than from combat up until World War II. And then there were another 200,000 men that were injured, seriously injured. Are you all hearing me now? Okay. Okay, hopefully you are. Um, shortly after the war, uh, a man who was involved in the Southport Community Service Program wrote a pamphlet about Southport that was published by the Community Service Organization, and it was called The, the Town That Found Itself. So I'm going to um, read you the opening paragraph of that. Liz? Yeah. I lost you twice. I lost you when you said 27 billion was the United States cost for the war. And then you came back on at the point where we're some, someone was asking a question where you started and you said 53,000 lost in battle. And then I didn't get anything from 27 billion was the cost of the war to 53,000 lost in battle. Oh, the only thing I said is that even more important than the money was the lives lost. Okay. It was quite dramatic. Yeah, well, no, that. <laughs> it was so sad that you lost me. <laughs> oh, um, that. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I can send these stats out when, um, at the end, in case, I'm sorry that you guys, that it got garbled. Did anybody else lose you? Yeah, I think some people did. I think okay. the reason that we lost you is because uh, the free version of Zoom actually cuts out after an hour and you have to sort of re-up again. So, yeah, but, but I, this is the paid version. Right, but all of us, I'm on the free version, so I don't know about everybody else. Me too. No, if she pays for it, we're on her version, which means we're not on the free version okay. right now. All right, well, I thought that's, because it was exactly one hour from when I logged on. Wow, I don't know. I thought if I paid for it, everybody, if I paid for it, if the Historical Society paid for it, uh, I thought that that would cover it. I think that is true, Liz. Okay. That as long as uh, the host is paying for it, then the guest will hear it as long as the host has paid for it. Okay. That's correct, mm -hmm. Liz. Okay. Did you, so did you all get it? Um, a lot of people yeah. died. Yeah. Yeah, we're good up to uh, go okay. back to the starting of the pamphlet. Okay, sorry about that. No problem. Okay, so this man who worked at the Community uh, Services Center, he probably was involved in the leadership of it somewhat, uh, he wrote this pamphlet. And so I want to read you the opening paragraph of what he wrote. It said, um, once upon a time, a little over two years ago, there was a town in our South which was socially poverty stricken. It was a century and a half old, and 60% of its white citizens were members of five or six families who had lived there for generations. Yet there were persons who did not know their own cousins living a few rods off. There were various social circles, clannish circles, whose members never met. Religious denominations did not mingle. There was no neighborliness to the town, no spirit of get together. The people themselves said so. It was the more surprising because the town was isolated by nature and has remained so for a lack of good roads. You might think that a community which is visited by a single train and single little riverboat a day would have learned to become socially self-nourishing, but it had not. Never at any time did the people of the town all get together to talk, to sing, walk, play, dance, listen to entertainment, or laugh together. In consequence, the town did not know itself. And incidentally, their children did not know how to play games and get fun out of them, which boded ill for the next generation. And thus things had been in this North Carolina town for a long while. And then he goes on in the rest of the pamphlet to explain how the, um, the community war service and the Army Navy Club had saved Southport from itself. 
So, you know, Liz, Liz, I have a question. Is this uh, is this in our archives? Do we have this pamphlet? Yes, we do. Okay, thank yes, you. Yes, it's in the Susie Carson Research Room, uh, digitized. If you wanted to read the whole thing, I oh, will great. add that to the list of additional resources. Thank you. So, did Southport find a common purpose in the war? Yeah, I think so. I think we've shown that it did. Um, but was it fair to say that prior to the war, the townspeople didn't care about each other or about how their town looked? Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't think so. We've seen. Um, you know, as historians, we look. We know this because of other evidence that we've talked about. Things like. Um, the, the Southport Women's Club, or at the civic organization as it was called at the time, they certainly did a great deal uh, to help the, the town and to be concerned about the, the, the betterment of the town and to get people together. And then there were several collaborative efforts by several churches. Uh, there's one that Bob Surge will be talking about at the next Tuesday talk, where uh, there was a church in town. I think that's, can everyone mute their, their uh, mics? There's a, there was a, uh, the St. Philip's Episcopal Church uh, needed, needed to raise money and they were a very small church and they didn't have enough. They decided to create a cookbook in order to, um, to raise money. And they really didn't have a big enough congregation to create a whole cookbook. And so women from other churches in town contributed cook, uh, recipes to the cookbook to help that church. So that's another evidence that uh, people did care. They did go across re uh, religious communities and they did help each other. And then if you look at the town's efforts to establish prohibition, which we'll talk about in a few weeks, their efforts to bring the railroad in and to promote Southport as a deep water port, there's a lot of evidence that the town did work together and did try to bring itself together. So um, I think that Mr. Coulter is wrong. Um, I think there's plenty of evidence that Southport has always had a sense of community and purpose. But that doesn't mean that this pamphlet is without value. Um, it does have a lot of information about what Southport was like at the time. And it's always exciting to find a contemporary source because the first thought is, oh, this was written at the same time as it happened. It must be completely accurate. But just like when we look at contemporary um, newspapers and news articles and, and things today, um, looking at this historical documents, we have to ask what's the agenda of the person that wrote it? Because whoever's writing it always has an agenda. And so you take, the, you take what's the true, but then you also validate, right? And you look at it with a critical eye. And so obviously a publication printed by the community service organization is going to be promoting the benefits of community service. And I think this man was also maybe promoting his own perpetual, perpetuating his job. So, but despite the flaw that this booklet probably gives too much credit to the community service program and not enough credit to the people of Southport, um, I do think there's evidence that's, that it's accurate in saying that the people of Southport did come together. They did find ways to help and encourage each other. So a few times during this presentation, I've alluded to the fact that Southport was dealing with segregation and Jim Crow laws, as was much of the country. And of course the military was segregated at the time. So there was a lot of racial tension. And when I stumbled across this news article, uh, I found it, I found it touching and I found it a cause for hope. It seems that the choir director of the Army Navy Club was working with a group of African American citizens to put together a choir concert. And this concert was performed at the open air grandstand at the Army Navy Club. And the title of the article reads, Negro Singers Give Southport Real Treat. War Camp Community Affair for Colored People Attended by Whites many summer residents. So this article was written and published in the local paper in Southport and then it was picked up by Wilmington. So the reason that it's important to them, the reason they reference many summer residents is that that's, that means Wilmington uh, residents because Southport at that time was a resort for, for Wilmington. It was a vacation spot. So that's why it's significant to them. So in the body of the article, it says that, it mentions that the Negro National Anthem, which is Lift Every Voice and Sing, was sung by the chorus and that it stirred the hearts of both whites and blacks. Now, 
I don't know, I can't tell from the article whether they're referring simply to the black choir singers or whether there were blacks in the audience as well. It's possible that they were because they did hold the performance outdoors. So they could have had um, both blacks and whites in the audience. If it had been inside the club, I would have thought that it was less likely because there wouldn't have been an area uh, to, to have segregated and the entire club was segregated. But in any event, this, this concert is significant. It took place in the summer of 1919. And that summer, that year, was one of the most violent periods of race relations in our entire country's history. There were more than 1,000 African Americans were killed by mob violence throughout the country, by, by white people, white mob violence. So I thought that Southport deciding to have an inspirational concert performed by African Americans during that time period and to have the local newspaper extol the virtues of the Negro National Anthem, which had just been named that by the NAACP, was an amazingly positive sign and an indication of the spirit and the, and the intention of the community. So, that's the end of our presentation about the World War I era in Southport. Here are the uh, additional resources that I will be sending you the links to, as well as a couple others that we mentioned during the course of the presentation today. I hope that you all enjoyed it, and I look forward to seeing you next week when we talk about the uh, flu pandemic of 1918.